today we're looking at justification and how can any of us stand before God on judgment day justified uh, you might be wondering what I mean by justification if you imagine a court of law on judgment day and you stand before God and God has a video of your whole entire life including all your thoughts and all your motives and emotions and he plays this whole video and at the end there's the decision are you guilty or not guilty if you're guilty then you're not justified but if God says I've looked at all of this I've seen what you've done you've done sin after sin every day for your whole life but I am gonna consider you not guilty that means you've just been justified that is what justification is now you might be thinking how can God do that how is that fair you know if, if you if today in the news you heard of a trial with two men one was guilty he did the crime and one didn't you would imagine it's cool for the judge at first to say to the guy who didn't do the crime say you are not guilty and you're like yeah he's justified that's good but the next guy who has done the crime the judge looks at everything he says you've done this you've done that you are not guilty everyone would be like that's not true he is guilty and this is the problem we have is that we believe God forgives us of our sins and that he justifies us and makes us not guilty but it's a completely unfair thing to believe and there's only one reason why we can believe it and that's because of the cross because Jesus died on the cross and because of that because of Jesus dying on the cross in our place and because of Jesus living an obedient life even to the point of dying we are declared righteous and we are justified if that still doesn't make any sense to you hopefully it will in the next few minutes justification is a legal declaration of not guilty okay that's that's what justification is a legal declaration a statement saying not guilty that's what justification is the opposite is condemnation condemnation is a declaration of guilty so on judgment day when we all stand before God you see they're gonna be condemnation it's gonna be guilty you're guilty or it's gonna be justification you're not guilty it's one of these two things there is no middle ground in a fair system now if you trust Jesus to save you if you trust him to save you then you will not be called guilty in front of God because you've been justified you've been declared not guilty and so you can have peace with God and live peacefully the rest of your days with God knowing that he's not gonna smite you one day check this out Romans 5 verse 1 therefore since we have been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ so justification is the way that we know we have peace with God and there's two parts to justification two parts the first part is forgiveness of your sins and the second part is imputation of Christ's righteousness a lot of big words here okay I couldn't think of a better word for imputation but if any of you can think in accounting terms then imagine it as something that is charged to your account or credited to your account so Christ's righteousness is credited to your account if you viewed your life as like a bank account <laughs> a moral bank account <laughs> are you in the red are you an immoral person who does sins all the time or are you someone who actually never does any sins now what we're going to find out today is that as people who trust in Jesus although we commit sins in our life God says I'm gonna I'm gonna chuck credit to your account righteousness so it looks as if you haven't done any sins I'm gonna bump up your account so it looks like you're completely in the clear even though you still do sins it's quite amazing so let's check out the first one forgiveness of your sins 
It says in Romans 8, 33, Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So God's elect is God's people, his chosen people. And Paul's saying here that no one can bring a charge against God's people. In other words, no one can go up to a Christian who's put their faith in Jesus and say, you're a terrible sinner, you've done this, that, that, you're guilty. Even the devil can't do that. Even demons can't do that. They can try it, but Paul's saying, what do they think they're doing? Because it's God who justifies. God is the person who has justified his people. In other words, he said what? What two words? Not guilty. That's what justification is. So God has said not guilty. So if someone says, ah, oh, you're this and you're that, the answer is not guilty. <laughs> not guilty. It's quite deep. It also says in Romans chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So look at that bit at the end. The Lord will not count his sin. In other words, from a bank account point of view, God looks at you, and even though you've committed loads of sins, he doesn't count them. He doesn't put them in the system. He doesn't type them in on the computer. He's like, I'm not going to count these sins. They do not go into their account. Instead, well, we won't go on to the instead yet, but for now you just need to know, if you trust in Jesus, if you trust that he's paid for your sins on the cross, that he's your Lord and Savior, then when you put your faith in Jesus, you're justified and all the sins in your life are not counted. If you imagine a big log book with all your sins in your life, they're not counted, which is good. We saw the other week how when we sin, we're building up wrath for ourselves for the day of judgment. That's your account getting full and full of God's anger and we know that because of the cross, God doesn't have that anger built up towards us. And we also know from what we're looking at today, that it's not like our sins are building up and then it's like, well, you've done this, 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 and this. The sins do not count in the logbook. Let me try it. This is complicated, so I'm going to try and give you a diagram that might help, right? This is a diagram of before the cross. Before Jesus died on the cross, you got us and you got Jesus. Now, Jesus is represented here as a circle with lots of plus signs. They're not crosses, they're plus signs, indicating that Jesus is morally good. He's righteous, he's right with God, and he just, he does good all the time. His whole life, he did good. He never did any wrong. So he's got loads of plus signs, yeah? Look at us now. The circle that represents us has got loads of minus signs, representing that we do bad. Even when we try and do good, it's like filthy rags to God. There's normally some motive at the back of our mind to make ourselves feel good or look good to someone else or, you know, whatever. Um, we are capable of doing some good things, but they're not going to be 100% good if we really examine all our motives and every reason for doing something. So we've got loads of minor signs. This is the situation before the cross. Problem with this is on judgment day, you go before God with all these minor signs. It's a pretty scary thought. I don't want to be going before God on judgment day like this. Don't worry, it doesn't end here. Next diagram. As a result of the cross, we get forgiveness of sins. God's people have their sins forgiven. And what's happened here is... Our minor signs have gone from us onto Jesus. Now, when did that happen? On the, cross. on the cross. That's right. On the cross, Jesus was our substitute. God laid on him the sins of us all, and he suffered the penalty for our sins. So this is the first part of justification. The first part of being declared not guilty is where God gets our sins, puts them on Jesus, and they're dealt with on the cross. So really important we all grasp this that if we trust in Jesus then our sins are not in our logbook as it were they're not reckoned to us our sins they're not counted okay everyone got this diagram okay good good yeah this is this is a nice one however 
However, this circle here only represents moral neutrality. In other words, you're morally neutral. Now, this circle here, there's no plus signs, are there? So you could go before God on Judgment Day and say, God, I haven't got any sins. Check the account, there's no sins, which is good. So you could be thinking, well, I'm not going to go to hell now, and that's pretty good. But where's the plus signs? Is there anything good about you? It, it doesn't really look like God could say, oh, you are so good. Come into heaven. Instead, it's like, okay, cool. There's no sins there. But you're morally neutral. There's nothing good about you. And it's like when my students sometimes, where they say, oh, sir, I didn't get sent out today, did I? <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, that's good. That's good that you didn't have to leave, you know, but... <laughs> There should be some good things as well. You know, you should be doing your work. It's not just about not getting into trouble. So that's why we need the second part of imputation. Uh, sorry, yeah. But the second part of justification is what I meant to say. And that's what we're going to look at now. The second part is the imputation of Christ's righteousness. In other words, Jesus' plus signs come into us. Jesus' righteousness is counted for us okay so now when we stand before God we've got all these plus signs here Jesus lived a really good life the best life anyone has ever led a perfect life never did anything wrong and that is in our logbook when we stand before God on judgment day so that's pretty good now you're standing before God you're not morally neutral you're righteous now that's what we're going to look at now, the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Check it out, Romans 5 verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners. Now, does anyone guess who this one man is? Adam. Adam, yeah. So he's saying, just like when Adam sinned in the garden, and as a result of that, all of mankind are sinners, in that same way, it says, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. So we got a reversal of what went wrong. Adam sinned. Everyone is affected by that, every human being. Then Jesus comes along, does the opposite to Adam, lives a completely perfect life. He's obedient to God his whole life, never sins. And he's obedient to God to the point that he dies on the cross and he does that, and that now is credited to our accounts, the people, at least to the people who put their trust in Jesus. It says, many will be made righteous. Now, next one, Romans 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul uses Abraham as an example. We don't have to go there now, but he's a guy in the Old Testament, a long time before Jesus, and it's saying here that because he believed God, because he trusted in God, as a result of putting his trust into God, that was credited to him as righteousness. Didn't mean that Abraham was righteous. Means that God credited righteousness into his account. So when we talk about righteousness being credited to us, we're not saying that inside we are changed to be righteous. What we're saying is that even though we still sin, God counts us as righteous, like in the logbooks. We're counted as righteous. But it doesn't mean we're actually changed as righteous inside. One day, we will have that. We're going to look at that another time. But for now, you need to know that when Christians say they've been counted as righteous, when we talk about the imputation of Christ's righteousness, we're not saying that suddenly inside, you turn into this righteous person that never ever sins. We know that isn't, anyone who's been a Christian for one day knows that isn't true. But what we are saying is that now Christ's righteousness is legally credited to us. So in a court of law, not only are we not guilty, but now we're declared righteous. Imagine that, the guy who's robbed loads of houses and the judge says, I know everything you've done, not guilty. You're righteous, you're a good guy. Get this guy a throne, <laughs> you know. Sounds unfair. But God can do that because Jesus took the punishment instead. And because Jesus lived a righteous life instead. Now, I know this is complicated. This is the kind of thing you might have to think about for a while. 
Um, and if, if you've had any kind of Catholic church background, this will be completely new because Catholics do not believe this. They do not believe that righteousness is credited to you. We won't go into what they do believe, but they don't believe that. But it's a really important thing to know that Jesus' righteousness is credited to you. The other thing that's important to know is that this is not something that anyone deserves. Remember I said once that it's a wonder that God doesn't destroy us the first time we commit a sin. You know, just like sometimes you get an angry parent outside Martin's. <laughs> You've seen it my whole life. Kid says something suddenly, whack, like that, because the parent's like, you, what? You know, and it's a wonder that God, the first time we do something wrong, he doesn't go, whoosh, and just destroy us. So we don't deserve this righteousness. And check it out. Justification is entirely by grace. It's entirely by grace. And I know another one of these words we're dropping in there. Um, but once you get the meaning of all these words, it's so meaningful. It's worth spending the time to learn them. Grace is sometimes called unmerited favor. In other words, you're given something that you don't deserve. Okay? Use whichever phrase helps you remember it. A lot of people remember unmerited favor. Uh, but not everyone knows what that means. They just, you ask them, what's grace mean? They say, unmerited favor. But if you, if you say to someone, it means you're given something you don't deserve, that I think that's a lot easier to actually get the meaning of it. So justification is not something any of us deserve, but God gives it to us. Check this out. Romans 3 verse 20. For no one is declared righteous before him by the works of the law. That's saying you don't get declared righteous by doing good things. So you can do good things. You can do the things that the Bible says to do, but you'll never be declared righteous, which means you'll never be declared, two words, not guilty. You'll never be declared not guilty by doing good things because you're always going to break one of the laws. You know, there's always one area you'll slip up in, or you might not love someone as much as you should, and you're a lawbreaker just by doing that, because God is perfect, and his standards are much higher than ours. So you can't ever be declared righteous by being good, and that's so important because when you become a Christian, you'll get these ideas in your head that you've got to keep being good and doing good things so that God sees you as righteous. And what we're seeing here today is that that isn't how it works. Jesus' righteous, righteousness is counted in your account. So you are righteous. Even though you might not be acting righteously, it's credited to your account, Jesus' righteousness. Another verse is Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. It says, For by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not from works so that no one can boast. So it says you're saved by grace. Grace is you're given something you don't deserve. So in other words, Jesus saves us even though we don't deserve it. Okay? And, and the way we're saved here, it says through faith. So it only applies if you have faith in Jesus. So when you hear People say, well, I know God is love. He died for everyone. I'm okay, but I don't believe in him. That is not a good place to be because you have to have the faith. Okay? So we put our faith into Jesus, our trust into Jesus to save us from our sins. And it says, this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. So he's saying that when you put faith into God and you are saved by God, that is not because of you. You can't say, yeah, I did this. Because if you do, you're boasting. And it says, it is not from works so that no one can boast. So the whole system set up so that no man can say, I'm a Christian. You know what I did? I did this and I did that and I'm good. All you can say is, I was given a gift. It says there, it is the gift of God. And it's, it's by grace. So it's undeserved. None of us deserve to be a Christian. It's a wonderful gift that God gives us. Instead of killing us and destroying us, he sends his son 
kills his son instead in our place so that we can live for eternity with God. It's amazing. And this is done by faith. So we're justified by faith. We're declared not guilty by faith. Check it out. Galatians 2.16 We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. So we covered that before. You're not justified by doing the works of the law. You can read what it says in the Bible. All the laws he gave the Jews to live, the Israelites to live out. You can do all those laws. You're not going to be declared not guilty by doing them because you're always going to slip up. Then it says, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we're justified by trusting in Jesus. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So, it's important to know faith does not earn you favor with God. It's not that if you put your faith in God, now God owes you. It's not like you've earned anything. But it is the means by which God justifies us. It's the way he's made the system. So that when you put your trust into Jesus, he justifies you. So we're justified by the merit of what Jesus did, not by the merit of what we did. You might wonder, why is it done this way? Why did God choose faith? Why are we justified by faith? Why not love? Why didn't he say, you know, you are justified by love? Or why not wisdom? You're justified by wisdom. Well, if you think about it, Faith, putting your faith in Jesus is the opposite to putting your faith in yourself. So the means that God uses to justify us, to declare us not guilty, is the means by which we say, God, I'm not going to depend on myself anymore because I can't do it. I keep sinning. I keep doing wrong. I'm not going to trust in myself. Instead, I'm going to trust in you now. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm trusting in you You'll be my Lord from now on. That's what faith is. So it's not about suddenly loving. That's why there was a guy called Spurgeon who said, with kids, don't bring your kids up with the first thing telling them to love God. The first thing is to teach them to trust in God. That's the first thing. You're not justified by love. You're justified by faith. And it says in Romans 4.16, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. God set up the whole system so that your justification, your salvation is not dependent on any works that you do. It's not that you can say, I've earned my right into heaven now, because none of us will ever be able to earn our way into heaven, no matter how good we try to be. But the whole system is set up so that you come to God and say, God, I can't earn my way into heaven. I'm trusting in you to pay for my sins, and to save me. When we do that, we're then justified. We're declared not guilty, and it's grace. It says here, so that the promise, in order that the promise may rest on grace, something that you don't deserve. This is what, how God set it up. So then he says, you don't deserve this. But I'm giving it to you as a gift. It's a wonderful thing. So, got some questions to think about. And you probably will have to go away and think about this. This is not an easy topic, um, but it's so important. First question is, have you come to Jesus, sorry for your sins, and put your trust in him? There's no point really in thinking about justification if we don't, haven't done the first step or if we're not going to do the first step. And there's people who've been in churches for years who've never done this. You know, it could be someone watching this on DVD who's been a so-called Christian for 10 years and they've never actually gone to Jesus, sorry for their sins, and said, I'm trusting in you now, instead of trusting in myself. But once someone's done that, the next question I think is, do you realize that you're declared not guilty and I know there's people who've been Christians for 10 years and longer who still feel guilty. And that's why this doctrine, this teaching is so important. That we learn that actually 
you, well, from when you put your faith in Jesus, you're declared not guilty. Not guilty. Even if you then went and did something terrible the next day, you've been declared not guilty. And the other question to ask yourself is, do you deserve this? Because anyone who thinks they deserve this needs to rethink their salvation. Because if they think they deserve this, then they're probably trusting in themselves instead of trusting in God. And we've got to be careful that we're not doing that. That we're not thinking, yep, yeah, I deserve what God's done. Some people think, well, I've done this, 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 therefore God has to do this, this, this. Doesn't work like that. The other question is, what two statuses will you have when you meet God on Judgment Day? There's two statuses. The first status is what? Not guilty. Not guilty. So on Judgment Day, if you've put your trust in Jesus, then you are, sorry, your status is not guilty. What's your second status? Righteous. You are righteous. It's not because of anything you've done. It's not, you haven't been changed inside and suddenly made righteous. It's just God's grace. He's like, I now consider you as righteous. I reckon you as righteous. In your logbook, it says you're righteous because it's Christ's righteousness. The whole life he led was a righteous life. Think about his, just everything in his life. He showed so much love to people. He healed people. He was obedient to God. There was never a time where God said, do this, and he chickened out. Never a time where he didn't witness boldly. Never a time where he didn't act in complete humility and love. Even when he's angry in the New Testament, it's a righteous anger when he's kicking everyone out of the temple. He does it in a righteous way. He was never selfish. Now, none of us in this room can say this about our own lives. But legally, in a court of law, if we put our trust in Jesus, then that, has actually, that whole life has been given to us in the logbook. So when we stand before God, legally, he says, you're righteous. Even though we didn't do all those things Jesus did, because Jesus is our substitute. Final question is, how does this affect how you treat yourself? and other people because if you can meditate on this and get this really as a big theme in your life then you're not going to start hating yourself not always thinking you're guilty because you're going to realize that Jesus's righteousness has been credited to you also you're going to start seeing other people the same way you see another Christian and you're like ah oh, they're that and they're that you start thinking yeah but Jesus's righteousness has been credited to them. So I'm going to stop judging them and have love for them. So I've got a memory verse here to remember. Romans 8.33 Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for what you did for us on the cross. And I thank you for the forgiveness of sins. I thank you for the declaration that we are not guilty. And I thank you also for your righteousness. I know that I could not live a righteous life. So I thank you for your life. I thank you for that. I thank you, God, that we didn't deserve it, but you still gave it to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.